Welcome to 15 Minutes. We are here today with Bill Rempel. He is a veteran investigative journalist with the LA Times. He is a consultant on the hit drama Narcos on Netflix. And he's also the author of three books, including the upcoming The Gambler, uh, which is about Kurt Praetorian and how he went from penniless dropout to the greatest deal maker in capitalist history. Welcome. We are so happy to have you with us. Thank you very much. All right, so to get right into it, uh, Kirk Krikorian's life, it seems like something that a screenwriter in LA came up with. Uh, what was it that first attracted you and drew you to writing about his life story? Well, actually it was a, an editor who uh, had read, read his uh, obituary in the New York Times and had that same reaction you just had. <laughs> it, it, his life was an amazing uh, thing and she, she was struck by how, how what a great life it was and how little we knew about him, and how, mm -hmm. what a surprise it was. And that's largely because he lived a life of you know, to protecting his privacy at great, uh, to the extreme. Uh, as great as he was, he wanted no no attention. He wanted no uh, applause. He wanted he, he gave billions of dollars away and didn't want credit for giving away money. So this is a kind of humble uh, beginning he had. But when I so I knew him only as the name in a in a in the business pages of the L.A. Times, um, and I didn't know much about him. So when I started looking. It was a little bit like I, 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 I was immediately drawn to him. I thought at first maybe we, we might have had the same father because we, had, we both had immigrant uh, fathers who, who were really active in business and not particularly successful at it. And uh, he went on to be a billionaire and I didn't. But it, there's some, some, the differences are striking. Mm -hmm. But but it was still it was the the immigrant story. Even though he was the the son of the immigrant, he was the first generation. It's very much an American tale. Mm -hmm. uh, someone who's self-made, who got the chance to uh, and 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 did and did it without anybody's help. He did it on his own his own effort and his own daring. And mm -hmm. so I I found him a fascinating character. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And you mentioned very briefly, uh, you were talking about his private life and how extremely, you know, closed he was to any kind of publicity and, and things like that. I imagine that must have been made really hard to research if, you know, there's yeah. barely inter any interviews and, and anything like that. How did you go about researching something like this? Because the book goes really in depth. It's fantastically well written, well researched. But no, if there's but, very little material to go off of, how did you go around doing that? Well, I'm finding pieces of it all over the place. But um, but he was he, he did not do interviews very often. In fact, uh, later in his career, after uh, he almost never gave an interview. He did not like to talk about himself. Mm -hmm. I mean, how many people are like that after all? Um, and so it was a challenge to be uh, and, and to to research him. And I I have this and I'm my background at the Times, LA Times, was as an investigative reporter. So it required some of those skills, frankly. Mm -hmm. uh, and mostly it was finding people who knew him who were still living. And that's a challenge because he died at the age of 98. Mm -hmm. He outlived most of his, uh, his early uh, uh, contemporaries. And so, uh, and, and also there was a challenge to the fact that a lot of the people in his uh, organization who had spent their careers protecting his privacy were st still protecting his privacy going into the grave. So uh, it, I had to overcome that. Mm -hmm. But there were a lot of people uh, who worked for him, who knew him, who were lo uh, in love with him, uh, who, who had uh, um, friendly relations as well, I mean, family friends, um, who adored him and so thought his legacy needed to be shared with history that it, it was mostly um, – a challenge to find them, but once once we got together and they realized uh, they had a chance to preserve his memory, they were not that hard to convince. Oh, that's great. But beyond that, there were also some things I found, you know, digging digging uh, into the record and mm -hmm. found some little nuggets. I, in uh, the, at UNLV, the University of Nevada Las Vegas has a library which I just stumbled upon the fact that they had an oral history that Kirk had had uh, rendered. He gave a, a lengthy tape recording. Where, so you hear his rich baritone voice 
telling stories about his 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 youth and his his career mm-hmm. was simply uh, priceless. Um, and, and there was a, a, a one of the things I, I thought I knew history pretty well, but I I discovered that he was a pilot uh, with the RAF, the Royal Air Force Ferry Command, mm-hmm. flew airplanes out of can out of canada to to the uh, to world war ii to the british uh, air force uh in in the uh, for a couple of years and i didn't even know that that group existed but it was a uh, a heroic uh, p- a group and kirk and i found a uh, that there was a, a um a documentary about about the raf ferry command that was uh, um that included Kirk talking again. He was on. He was on tape, and I and the the producer of it gave me the outtake so I could I could see more of what Kirk saw, talked about. So I I got some great luck in finding Kirk speaking for himself. Uh, someone who is that so rare. It was you know, when you find something like that, you, it's like it's like hitting a hitting a mother load. It's priceless. Yeah, exactly. Was there anything that you found about his life that you wanted to go further in depth to, but you just didn't have the resources for it, or you couldn't find anything on it? Well, not really. Um, his For a, a narrative story of his life, I had to pick and choose anyway. Um, and and uh, there were areas that I could have gone more in more depth on, but I just... Uh, um, there wasn't there wasn't room. Uh, I mean, it's such a rich life. Such a um, I mean, there obviously I could as a as a writer I can sit here and tell you, oh, I missed this. I wish I had that. There's dozens of things like that. But the fact is, what we were able to get was so so wonderful that I try not to uh, to f- focus on what I didn't get. <laughs> Absolutely. So you mentioned his family, uh, the immigrant story. He's mm. Armenian American. His uh, father and he came over, and he is. Uh, you mentioned throughout uh, several times in the Gambler, you talk about his his background and his Armenian connections. And can you just talk us uh, through a little bit about that and the influence that his background and his family had on him? Sure, sure. I mean, Kirk Akorian is a saint in Armenia. Um, and he earned that by being the most generous and uh, and devoted Armenian you can find. Um, he he was his father came over and his mother they were and they were illiterate they were uh, they were farmers they uh, they had no special skills they were just the typical immigrant eager to start here. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, so, and Kirk's childhood was marked by the fact that they were evicted from the farm uh, up in California. They lived in Los Angeles and they moved constantly because they couldn't pay the rent. I mean, this, Kirk began so far from the Forbes list of richest Americans that you cannot imagine. Mm-hmm. So, and that was some of the appeal of, to, of the character to me, of course. But, but he always was an Armenian. And he lived in the and with the Armenian community in Los Angeles, mm-hmm. and and when he uh, uh, when he really uh, I mean he was always supporting them once he was make, making making uh, uh, a fortune. And I might say he was an overnight success after he'd been working for about twenty years. He was in his he was fifty years old when he made his first fortune. So this is not a man who who lived a whole life of uh, in luxury and wealth. But uh, he's, he was always a supporter of uh, Armenian causes. And in 1988, they had a big earthquake that just devastated the country. Mm-hmm. And he stepped up and started an airlift to take supplies. And he was, of course, he had a little uh, his own charter airline, so he was familiar with flying and, and needs. Anyway, he, he arranged for the airlift. And Armenian groups got together under his uh, um, organization, essentially, and flew medicine, food, supplies, uh, and, and he went and started building roads and, and, and schools and, uh, and, and uh, apartment buildings. And so, uh, the, the, um, the Armenians like to you know, said that, uh, the, the Azerbaijanis, uh, next door have oil, but, uh, Armenia had Kirk <laughs> That's such so, a great okay. saying. And here's the thing. He didn't want his a condition of his support was that he didn't they didn't 
build parks with his name. They didn't put streets in his name. There is no Kirkakorian building anywhere in Armenia. <clears throat> so, again, his his humility and or his humbleness was profound. He he his sense was if you get something in return for your charity, it isn't charity, and he wanted it to be charity. So, a remarkable man. Absolutely incredible. Um, just talking about that whole rags to riches thing for a second. Um, you know, you hear about it so rarely nowadays, like genuine true stories like that of Kirk Kikorian. So he started out from, you know, getting evicted from the farmland in California to owning the MGM Grant. He started <laughs> off the chapter talking about Cary Grant and Raquel Welsh and how they were looking for him at the party. And yeah. uh, in addition to that, he also, I mean, Las Vegas at that time was kind of overrun by the mob and by the mafia, but he yeah. managed to avoid that completely. How, in a, like, Las Vegas is notorious for its mob connections. How did he manage to do that? Well, Kirk didn't need mob money. He had, he had his own. I mean, mm -hmm. that's, the, that's the short answer, but more than that, he, um, uh, he, Howard Hughes and Kirk Kikorian sort of arrived in uh, Las Vegas and developing uh, hotels at about the same time. And between Kirk and Howard, they rewrote all the rules. Now, bef up until that time, the, the reason the mob was there is because traditional bank bankers uh, did not make loans to casinos. Um, even though it was legal, and you, we see a little of that in today's uh, issues with marijuana, where it's legal, banks can't are making loans. It, it's an issue. It's still um, something we deal with now. But in, back then, it was over gambling. So gambling was illegal in all over the country, except not in Nevada. So, so in order to build those hotels and casinos, at the early on, uh, developers turned to uh, to the mob. Kirk did not. He didn't have to had his own his own money and and he was able to get financing when he needed it overseas so mm -hmm. he rewrote those rules and as a consequence the mob was put out of business essentially i'm not saying you don't have crime and, and organized and otherwise but mm -hmm. but the 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 chicago mob no longer controls uh, any doesn't get the kickbacks kirk kikorian put the um the shareholders of his company in in the front seat, not not the not the mob accountants. Mm -hmm. So basically, kind of shut that down a little bit for them. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. It was it, it didn't happen it didn't happen overnight, but it, in, in but Kirk never partnered with the mob. He bought their hotels, he bought them away, uh, so he did have dealings with them. But he was never a partner of the mobsters, and he, his his uh, uh, gambling license was never in jeopardy. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So if there's one thing, it's kind of a cliche question, but if there's one thing that you want people to take away about Kirk Akori, what would it be? Well, it's, it's the inspiration. Uh, his life is an inspiration. It's inspirational to me. It's, he's the, is the, um, the all American story of, of someone who, who uses hard work, integrity, and daring because he was a gambler. He was definitely a gambler. Um, and he took chances, and and that, that the the thrill of the risk appealed to him greatly, and and was a factor in how far he was able to go. Mm -hmm. So a little bit of luck. I mean, he was a lucky guy too, to some degree. Definitely. He didn't like it that, but because he was a calculated risk taker, he didn't he didn't just make wild bets. Although I do have the story in there once where he bet one million dollars on one roll of the dice at a, at a craps table. And you'll have to read it to get the whole context. But it's who would do that? No, but a dare. Kurt <laughs> That's right. So just going sidetracking for a minute, when I announced I was doing this interview with you, everyone at the office got very excited, especially because they all love Narcos, uh, <laughs> which you served as a consultant for based on that the book that you wrote, uh, At the Devil's Table, I believe it was called. Yes, that's it. Can you tell us a little bit about that experience, what that was like? All, all of that. Well, the the at the devil's table was a was the a book that that took twelve years to get ready because it involved the um, the story of a man who was in witness protection and who to this day I don't know where he lives. So uh, I, doing those interviews was 
had its own set of challenges. By the mm-hmm. you know, it's not like Kirk Corian who never gave, he never this man never gave interviews. He, he he didn't even come out from behind witness protection. Mm-hmm. So when he did, it was always on his terms, not mine. And so it took years. Mm-hmm. But once once the, the book came out, it was uh, it, it was a, an extraordinary story about a, a, again another a, one man's daring to uh, to take on the powers uh, that would kill him and his family. Mm-hmm. And it's just I find it another heroic, wonderful, inspiring story um, uh, that uh, that has been made into not only the narcos do do that do use it as their as their story, but um, there's a Spanish language 80 episode series that was done that was extraordinary as well. So I love seeing these the, the story show uh, appear all over because uh, Jorge George Salcedo, the character, is uh, a real man, a real uh, incredible man, as a matter of fact. And and to see his his story get such wide exposure is uh, very satisfying to me. Mm-hmm. You seem to have a knack for finding out these really inspirational stories and just putting them to paper. Well, it, um, it's 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 what I'm looking for. Great stories, obviously. That's what a journalist does. But uh, I've been very fortunate to discover and have been been found by interesting people. So I. And I don't take it for granted because they have to trust me. In the case of George Salcedo, he had to trust me with his life. That's uh, mm-hmm. a pretty uh, a heavy, heavy obligation. With Kirkorian, I, he's gone, but but I do think that his his legacy is so important and so valuable that I, I want to do it justice as well. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So. Just to finish up here, previously you've written about the former Philippines dictator, Ferdinand Marcos, and you wrote about the Cali cartel, which we've just kind of talked about. And now you've written about Kurt Gregorian. All of these people or groups are incredibly rich. Can we expect to see any (laughs) other new books about billionaires joining your collection so far? Well, maybe so. I don't know. I'm hoping that one day I learn what the the trick is so that I join them. (laughs) So far, not so good on that part, but uh, no, good. I just want good stories and interesting people, and it's uh, it's a delight to to bring bring those stories to the public. Mm-hmm. Well, you have a wonderful legacy that you have. Well, thank you, thank you. All right, thank you so much for joining us. The Gambler goes on sale January twenty third next uh, week. Yes, thank you so much again. <laughs> it's a pleasure. Thank you very much. <laughs>